but gaming was notably notably but gaming was notably but gaming was notably better What is up guys, welcome back to the channel. So around about a month ago, 30 days ago, actually I'm a little bit late, that's because I've had no electricity, but the lights are on, so yay. But anyway, I said I was going to incorporate the Delta 15 into my life and I was going to use it in everyday use, which I did. I did everything from Excel, Word, emails, gaming, rendering, everything that one could possibly do with a laptop or generally do. So I am going to be talking about the design, the performance, the specifications, the features, everything that you would want to know about this laptop, but I'm also gonna be talking from personal experience having actually used this laptop for an extended period of time. But before I ramble on too much, let's look at this unit a little bit closer. Starting off on the design, so this laptop was very reminiscent of the Stealth 15M that I did a few months ago. I mean, I'll put the two side by side so that you can compare them, but the weights and dimensions were so similar in that this comes in at 1.9 kilograms, its dimensions are 35.7 by 24.7 by 1.9 centimeters. So very, very compact and small form factor laptop that you can easily transport. It's beautiful and it's simplistic and it's also solid. It's completely made of a metal alloy or I think it's an aluminium alloy actually, but it also screams that I'm classy and sophisticated. If you look at the specs, it's gonna say, well, I'm gaming, but with regards to the actual design, it's actually a laptop that can suit quite a few different types of users. The attention to detail on this laptop is also fantastic, even though it's very simple in its design. If you look underneath, it's got a great air intake on the sides where the mechanism for the display <laughs> goes. You can even see that they've put a logo there. Even on the top left or top right, depending on the orientation of the laptop, they've got a beautiful logo that's been put there. And all of this together is also, I say solid a lot, but it's very well put together. Now the keyboard I did use for a month and it was a great typing experience, a great gaming experience. It's kind of a hybrid keyboard in that it's not obviously mechanical, you're not gonna get that kind of feel, but I don't think that MSI is going for a full gaming laptop here. I actually don't think that at all. We'll talk about that in performance, but great typing experience. I did do Excel, I did do Word, I did emails, I did everything that one would normally do with a laptop and no issues, really good experience. Now the bezels are not the thinnest, but they're also not too thick, so it doesn't have a cheap look. Now I was really concerned about the lamination, especially with regards to the bottom of the laptop, but even, don't tell MSI, but like fiddling around with it, you could actually see that this was really, really well structured and a solid panel. Thermal design, obviously we're gonna speak about more in performance, but the thermal design looks very good. It looks aggressive from the bottom and the sides, obviously not so much from the top, but again, we'll speak about that when we get to performance. Overall, I really enjoyed the understated but sophisticated look of this laptop, especially with the fact that it has so much performance just waiting to be released, but it's not screaming that in your face. On to specs and starting off with the CPU as we always do. It is a full AMD solution in that it has a 5900HX, which is an eight core 16 thread processor. If you do wanna know, starts off on 3.3, clocks up to 4.6. It also has a integrated graphics in Vega graphics in the CPU. Now the dedicated graphics is an RX 6700M, M being for mobile, which is also AMD, and that has 10 gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM. 
Onto RAM, it has 16 gigs of DDR4, and that is at 3200 megahertz. CAS latency, the same as we've seen pretty much all over the board on CL22, which is poor, but it's just become the standard. Storage wise, we have a one terabyte SSD. We will look at the performance when you get there, but it is on a PCIe 4 bus. Onto the panel, this has a 15.6 inch full HD IPS level display. It is a 240 hertz panel, which keep this in your mind, I do think is a bit too much for this laptop. Webcam, disappointment, but again, this is standard across every make, every brand, in which we have a 720p camera at 30 frames per second, and I believe 0.4 megapixels. Wi-Fi, nice to note that it has Wi-Fi 6E, but obviously to take full advantage of this, you do need to have a 6E solution router. One thing to note on specs is there is no RJ45 or Ethernet, but you can get a USB adapter should you want to actually have a physical Ethernet connection. On to speakers, we have a two by two watt speakers, which are nice and clear. And the program that actually runs them with inside the laptop is Nymec. Now round and round we go as we look at the IOs in the laptop. Firstly, we have got one HDMI, which supports 4K at 60 Hertz. We do have a USB-C, which is 3.2 Gen 2 X2. We have two USB-A's, which are USB 3.2 Gen 2. And we have one USB-C 3.2 Gen 1 by 2, which has DisplayPort support. On to performance. And before we jump into performance, there's just a couple of things that I'd like to mention before we jump into it. So the first thing is that the graphics card is underwatted or undervolted in that the max that I saw was between 75 and 80 watts on the 6700M. But I think that speaks to the purpose of the laptop in that I'm not full gaming. There were situations and there are actually quite a few situations and it's not that abnormal, but the actual integrated and the dedicated worked together, which was quite nice and notable in the performance. The second thing that I want to note is that the thermals were actually quite good. And this is considering the TDP of the CPU itself, which we'll look at when we get to performance. But now that that's out of the way, let's take a look at the actual performance. As always, let's start off with a Cinebench and we'll start off on single core where we hit 1493 above CPU Monkey's 1478 and then we have other CPUs there including the 6900HX4 comparison. What I did find odd is on multi-core and I did everything from resetting the laptop to doing this test quite a few times to try and find out why, but we hit a low 12597 as opposed to CPU Monkey's 13. 875 and this wasn't a result of under wattage it was actually pulling high watt so this is an anomaly to me and i don't understand however it wasn't that noticeable during actual performance now as promised our database is building up in that this laptop scored a 1845 on a storage benchmark and then we have the gigabyte and the rog there as comparisons on something like an NVMe, this is not much to worry about because this is more about game loading speeds, but there's minimal difference in between these results and we're talking about milliseconds. Now onto something that is important or more important, we hit a score of 7039 on PC Mark. So we can see all the other comparatives before in the MSI Gigabyte, the G513, now the Delta coming in a third, just below the M16 and obviously the G733Z. So really good score here. 3D Mark a Time Spy, we hit a score of 9344, really good. And this is more edged towards gaming laptops. So having beaten a ROG M16 is a very good indicator that this laptop does have a full gaming solution or complement should you need it. 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme, I was actually really surprised by this. We hit a score of 4260 versus the 12th Gen 3070 Ti, which is the ROG G733Z, which hit a score of 5. 596. VR mark, no surprises here. AMD is not very well suited to VR gaming, especially with Nvidia just dominating that space, working with devs and so on and so forth. But a 6905 compared to the massive 14080. So if you are getting this laptop to do VR, 
don't. Now, frequencies, we can look at the wattages first. So we did hit a massive 139 watt pull on the CPU, which is why I mentioned earlier that Cinebench was so weird because we definitely had the full complement of the wattage pull and the thermals were quite stable, which we'll get to. GPU pulling a max of 76, which you could say is under watted or under vaulted. But again, I think that this is determinant or a determining factor of the type of laptop that it is. Frequency on the CPU we hit a max of 4566 and on the GPU triple two four. Crystal disk performance not very good of something that's on PCIe 4 but on read we had a 2245 on write we had 1963 on peak performance real world performance lower at 1369 on read and 1289 on write. Crystal disk on IOPS, we hit a 47,000 on read and 54,000 on write, which is also quite low and then significantly lower on real world, 10,000 on read and 17,000 on write. Moving on to gaming benchmarks, Formula One at native 1080p set to ultra high, minimum FPS of 80, average of 92, maximum of 105. Rainbow Six Siege, maybe this is where the 240 hertz made a little bit more sense. Also an ultra, a minimum of 198, an average of 248, and a max of 328. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, ultra high 1080p, 32 on a minimum, average 69, max 167, which is obviously just a rendering. Don't call it an anomaly, but you'd really be looking at the 69 here as a benchmark. Far Cry 6 at Ultra was 68 on minimum, average of 88 and a max of 100. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we had 129 on minimum, on the average 177 and the max of 302. So if you are gonna be setting these settings lower, obviously the 240 hertz makes more sense, but we'll get to that in conclusion. Last but not least, let's go to the temperatures and we'll start off with the benchmarking programs. So for 3D Mark Time Spy, we had an average CPU of 85 and a max CPU of 97, normal for this type of program. On the GPU, a low average of 68 and a max of 90. For 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme, this is obviously where we'll see the most notable temperatures. 83.6 on the average CPU, 99 max on the CPU on the GPU average of 71 and the max of 87. On PC mark, we have an average CPU of 69 and a max of 95. On the GPU, an average of 47 and a max of 70. Lastly, but not least, Cinebench, we are gonna ignore the graphical component because this stresses the CPU. We had a average of 92, which is normal, and a max of 95, which is also fairly normal. Moving on to gaming, Formula One, we had an average CPU of 86.5 and a max of 96. For the GPU, average of 87 and a max of 92. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege, 92.8 average on the CPU and max 96. For the GPU, we had an average of 71 and a max of 79. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, average of 91.3, max of 96. The average of the GPU was 90.2 and the max of 91. For Far Cry 6, we had average CPU of 87.4, a max of 96.1. Average of 72.8 on the GPU and max of 82. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we had an average of 83.5 on the CPU and a max of 96. On the GPU, we had an average of 79 and a max of 89. Now, looking at the max GPU temperatures, unlike CPUs who actually say T-junction is 105 or 100, GPUs never actually tell you what the maximum should be. So we can note that the CPU is always higher than the GPU. So it would be really interesting to know that if we had increased the wattage by five or 10 watts, what those max GPU temperatures would have been. But it's not really safe because it's not like Nvidia or AMD is gonna say, okay, cool, this is what the max should be. But it will be really interesting in the future to up the wattage a little bit and see what happens. 
On to conclusion, and I think we've established that this is not a full gaming solution. I think this is aimed at businessmen who secretly want a game at night, or someone that wants a really powerful laptop, or even a designer that needs a laptop that is mobile, because we do have the 6700M, which can obviously do creative functions. Now, the performance is really good, as we saw in the performance, and the battery life is actually oddly very good, three to four hours without using any of the battery saving techniques, so I was really surprised about that. The thing that really puzzled me is that this is a full AMD solution so I thought it would absolutely smash away at your design or rendering like video editing but gaming was better for me or personally was better for me than rendering. Still did good in rendering but gaming was notably better. I do think that the 240 hertz on this panel was very overkill. Hardly did I ever hit that in high-end gaming. So rather than having a 240 hertz, I would have rather seen a 120 hertz, and maybe if the cost saving made sense, up the 16 gigs of RAM to 32 gigs of RAM. Looking at the price, so when I first looked at this laptop when a month ago, I saw it for 33999. It has changed, but so is the RAM dollar, so is a few things. So you can get them for 34999 at both macro as well as computer. Computer mania but the thing that's most important is if you actually look at the performance that this laptop gives you comparing to what you can actually find for 35,000 Rand or 34999 if you want to be technical I think that this has a very good value for money offering so take 45 of my final final conclusion Having used this laptop for the period of a month, I can say that I honestly enjoyed it. It was so nice. Now, don't get me wrong. I love gaming laptops. I love the power. I love the size. I love everything about gaming laptops. But it was so nice to have something that was subtle and that I could just put in my bag quickly and go off to a coffee shop when load shedding hit. Talking about load shedding, I could watch a few movies while I was waiting for the electricity to come on. So overall, I really enjoyed this laptop and it has everything that anyone could possibly need in a laptop at a very good price point. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this review. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Cheers and goodbye.